Welcome to um, a new lecture in the basics of macromolecular crystallography. Um, today, Jim Flugrad is going to tell us in the second part of his um, two lectures about diffraction image processing, scaling, and statistics revealed. Now, whatever you want to do with macromolecular crystallography, knowing your scaling and your statistics is important. It is the final data processing step before you actually endeavor into trying to phase and then model your structure. And it's often crucial for the question on whether you can solve a structure and if to which quality you can get in the end. Um, I have already introduced Jim last week, but I will do so again. He studied at Rice University. Um, he joined as a postdoc in the Huber Lab in Martinsried, Germany. Um, then went on to Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories, where he was already involved in things like detector images and what we would call today methods development, and possibly even then it was called methods development. Um, that was back in 1986. While being at Cold Spring Laboratory, he also founded a series of courses and um, diffraction methods, which has been happening every year since then, except for this year where due to Corona, everything is a little bit different. But uh, this course has been hugely successful and actually inspired quite a lot of people. Although I was invited as, an, um, as a tutor or as a lecturer to it, it inspired me too. Um, he then joined in 1994 Molecular Structure Cooperation, which in 1996 became Rigaku. He's written his own integration software, the Star Trek, which many of you may know. And um, it's quite a, actually quite an honor to have him lecture here. So, well, let's have it. I'm handing my screen to you, Jim. All right, thank you very much. So I think if I press share screen, and I go to my PowerPoint. Whoops, that did not happen. I have to select this desktop. So can you see what I'm, my title slide? Yes. All right, so I'll, I'll just carry on then. Because so on my screen, I see only myself and my, my uh, title slide. So today I was going to do the second lecture, which is, uh, has, is a natural division after the first in terms of diffraction image data processing. And this, at this point, we have our integrated intensities. And I'm going to talk about the scaling and the statistics of those integrated intensities uh, using a, just a, a generic talk. Uh, it's not beholden to any particular software package. And all software packages do something similar. Although I will highlight things from XDS and HKL 3000. There are other packages which I will also mention. So if I go to the next slide, that worked, right? Uh, we are doing molecules to models, as we've shown in the previous slide, where we're going to get our purify our uh, macromolecules, proteins, DNA, whatever, grow the crystals get those crystals into a diffraction experiment, solve the phase problem, calculate the density, build a model, validate the model. And from that, we get this model and we help alleviate human pain and suffering because even though while it's fun to have the model, we need to have a purpose for that model. And I did discuss uh, the steps of once you have your images, I didn't discuss too much about collecting those images. That happened in a previous lecture by uh, Jean-Luc Gersantoni. But once you have a set of images, whether from one crystal or multiple crystals, you search for spots, do something called indexing to get the unit cell of the crystal and its orientation, refine those properties, predict them, go out and integrate them. And now we have uh, several lists of Miller indices, HKL, the intensities corresponding to those HKLs and their standard deviations. And this lecture is all about scaling. The reading material, I think I showed a couple of these, but this, these three things are in particular related to scaling. There are other things out there, and I want to remind people to go ahead and read these papers because in this field, there are some textbooks, but they do not go into the details of these papers. Uh, Phil Evans has one, Scaling and Assessment of Data Quality. 
And then Andy Karklis and Kai Diederichs has one about maximizing the data quality in macromolecular crystallography. And while preparing for today's talk, I came across Greta Osman, Mai Tian Wang, and Kai Diederichs' uh, paper from just a couple months ago that is called Making a Difference in Multi-Dataset Crystallography, Simple and Deterministic Data Scaling Selection Methods. And I'll talk, I'm gonna introduce that. And I'm gonna ask you later to just review that paper in the Journal Club. So the goals for this seminar are to talk about the theory of scaling, why do we do it, how do we do it, review some of the statistics, and give examples from a few packages, XDS, HKL, and DIAL. So uh, to make this more complete, here is a uh, copy of the front page or the first of uh, the abstract of the HKL 3000 package, and it's uh, written by Vladik Meider, Zvisha Ogonovsky, Marcin, and Max, uh, Martin Simborowski and Max Krutz, who uh, are the principal authors at the time this was published. I'm sure other people have gone on to do other things. In particular, Dominika Borek has uh, changed the way some of the scaling is done and the rejections are done. And the other package that you should be very familiar with in your career is the XDS package. This paper is a, a follow-on paper from Wolfgang Kopsch, who was at the Max Planck Institute in Heidelberg, and this is the 210 Octocris paper, whereas the original papers were written and published in uh, 1988, actually a long, long time ago. Uh, in addition to that, another package that's being used nowadays is the uh, dials package from the Diamond Light Source, and, and this is just a screen grab from their publications online, and these things are also and active are uh, this group uh, with uh, Graham Winters and headed up by uh, Gwyneth Evans is an active group in building data processing software. Uh, and the group is now spread not only at Diamond, but over at, uh, in California at, uh, I think it's LDL, uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab. So these are things that if you're going to be processing data, you will want to be familiar with all of them. So we have this uh, diffraction data. What are, what are our goals for the data? Our expectations on how good the data has to be is uh, dependent on how we're gonna solve the phase problem. And these are different methods of solving the phase problem where single anomalous diffraction phasing is perhaps requires the absolute best data, particularly if the anomalous signal is weak, say from a sulfur, intrinsic sulfur is found in the molecules that were used to grow the crystals. There is a multi-wavelength phasing that needs very good data, uh, not as necessarily as good as SAD data, but you're looking for very good data. Isomorphous replacement is where you use two crystals, whereas these first two methods can use uh, single crystals. The native and the phased, the crystal used for phasing are the same. Isomorphous replacement has a native, and you add a marker atom like a mercury, or maybe a gold atom or perhaps a substrate that has a selenium to change the or to shift the phases and you look at those phase shifts by subtracting the native data from the derivative data and determining the phases. Molecular replacement is using a homologous model uh, to rotate and translate into your data to actually the phases come from that homologous model and you try to find a match to your intensities and then carry on from there. Molecular, molecular substitution is perhaps the easiest. It's a subset of molecular replacement. It's where you use the same space group and the same units, essentially the same unit cell, almost the same molecule, but maybe you have a mutation or a substrate. And in general, there's no question that you have a very good idea of the phases because you're starting from a known structure within the same crystal form. So these are the goals for our data. It's always to get the structure. I had talked about table one before. This is a slightly different table one. It's from horse hemoglobin collected at Cold Spring Harbor Lab. And the space group is different. And it's not as nice as the previous table one from the last talk because that was a very, very nice uh, hen egg white lysozyme, which diffracts really well. This doesn't diffract as well. It doesn't go to as high a resolution, although still relatively high resolution for many people. And the R measured and the R uh, 
R merges are worse and so on, and the I over sigmas are less. Nevertheless, uh, this is just a table showing you what they look like. All packages now produce a table one. In, the, in that table, we're looking for that you have, have geometric completeness. You've collected all the possible data that diffracts from the crystal out to a given resolution. You have multiple or repeated measurements because you'd like to average them to help reduce the uh, random noise in them and get a more accurate and more precise uh, final output that goes on to the phasing. Uh, in those tables are the R measured and the R merge, which we'll discuss later, the signal to noise ratio, the maximum resolution, and oftentimes some other kinds of signals are reported such as and we'll show this later. So I mentioned this before, accuracy and precision. Uh, accuracy is do you have the true value and precision is, is how reproducible it is. So I had used talking about the height of people that they have a systematic error if they're wearing shoes, for instance, and so they don't necessarily have their correct heights unless they take their shoes off and they're standing up tall. And precision is how often, you know, um, how reproducible. If you measure the same value over and over and over, you get the same answer. Once again, for the difficult phasing problems, uh, precision does not trump accuracy. In fact, you could have one measurement that was absolutely accurate for every HKL in the bifoot pair, and you could solve the structure. Uh, but it also, though, is, is if you have fantastic precision, but going to the wrong number, it's not going to help you. So Charles Reland put this in his book, No Amount of Precision Can Make Up for Inaccuracy. So this is a, a hopefully a new slide here. And uh, let me move something on my screen so I can read it. The end result of this diffraction experiment is a list of Bragg reflections indexed or labeled by their Miller index H, K, L in the three principal directions of the crystal lattice with the integrated intensity indicating, uh, shall we say, the diffracted photons from that reflection or that group of reflections that have the same Miller index and the standard uncertainty or sigma of that. So what happens in the experiment after integration, you actually have a measurement for each spot in your series of images that you collected by the rotation method. And, we'll call, and that would be the jth measurement for a reflection of a given HKL. And you might have five measurements of the same Miller index and its symmetry related mates. So J would go from one to five. And you also have the Poisson counting statistic derived standard uncertainty or the sigma for that. And given that these two things come from integration, you can now calculate an average of all of those, those J reflections for a given HKL using a weighted average. And this weighted average, uh, for those who are physicists or whatever you could say, this is like a center of gravity determination. This, the weights are here, and the weights are one over the standard deviation squared. And so it's the weight times the intensity divided, these summed. And if we just divided by uh, J, it would be the average. But we want a weighted average, so we multiplied by the weight and divided by the sum of the various weights. So WHJ is the weight, as we showed. And the other thing in here is the so-called scale factor. G, J sub K is a scale factor applied to this observation. and it's indexed by K and J because K is for the scale factor for a group of reflections. And J is the scale factor for that particular reflection. So it looks like in theory, we could have a lot of different scale factors, including one per measurement. But the reality is, is that we tend to group reflections together to get the same scale factors. For example, all of the reflections in image 100 at the same resolution band, or all of the reflections in crystal number two at the same uh, resolution bands and so on. So it's important to know that there are many scale factors and, and we're not, and they're usually restrained, and so they're not going everywhere. And now 
much of the rest of this talk is how do we get these scale factors, okay? So that we can then go back in and calculate the average intensity for a group of reflections with the same Miller indices. And we can calculate the standard deviation as well, uh, which comes from all of the uh, incoming standard deviations. I had talked about Poisson counting statistics before, and just briefly, it's that uh, if you have some quantity Q, the variance is Q, and the standard deviation, which is the square root of the variance, is the square root of Q. And we do error propagation, so the errors add by variances, and so uh, I did talk about the principal thing we're subtracting in integration is background, and you need photons to get uh, a decent, let's say relative error, to get a good measurement and, uh, that you hope is precise and accurate. And having extra background screws that up. So that's an experimental error. So now on to the new stuff. This is scaling. We are doing scaling for these four, four principal reasons. We're gonna determine and confirm the crystallographic space group. We're gonna correct for systematic errors that we can discover and correct for. We're going to validate these standard deviations or these sigmas, and by doing that, we'll describe it. We want the observed uncertainties to match the expected uncertainties, and we want to reject the outliers. Now, I will say this over and over again, we can't reject outliers unless all of these other things are good, and we can't get all of these other things good unless we reject outliers, so you iterate through this. You reject outliers, go back and make sure you have the right space group, that you're correcting the errors, and you're validating the signals, and you'll see that. So if we look at the scaling in the HKL3000, HKL2000, or the program known as HKL, not only does it do the things I just mentioned, it also combines the so-called .x files, which is you get one .x file for every uh, diffraction image that is integrated. and this. These .x files contain the Miller index and I and sigma I, and a little bit of information about the spots on the image. Those, those spots could be partial, not completely full, and I talked about partiality last time. In general, they apply a scale factor to each .x, so for each image, it gets its own scale factor. So the G that I talked about, they, the, the spots on a, an image is a natural way or a logical way to group a set of reflections together into a scale factor. The other thing that HKL does in scaling is it does a post refinement. So it refines something called mosaicity better. And this tells us whether a spot really did intersect the evolved sphere while that image was being collected. And it also adds together the partial reflections from adjacent images to get a full reflection. And I briefly showed a diagram of this, I thought, last week. So once again, we'll determine and confirm the space group, correct the systematic errors, validate the sigmas, and reject the outlier measurements. And of course, then we'll output stuff for humans to read and look at and judge whether the process is completed. So determine and confirm the space group. There are three things that determine the crystallographic space group. And often, as a new crystallographer in a lab, you you're usually come from a, well, there's many ways you can get to it, but let's say you're a molecular biologist, you've purified your sample, your protein, you've put it into trays either with pipette men that you do yourself, or you put it into a robot, you grow the crystal, you, somebody has taught you how to flash cool it, you flash cool it, put it into pucks, you collect, you go to a beamline, collect the data, the beamline scientist is there helping you, all this data is coming out. It's not exactly hitting you in the face, but at least it's going into your eyes that you see. And then you have to process it, and often this is done automatically. But in all of that, you don't have to know any crystallography. But the first kind of crystallography introduction you'll have is what is a space group? And I did talk about Lowy uh, classes and uh, Brave lattice types last week. Uh, the vocabulary switches depending on who you talk to. There's probably is a correct vocabulary, and um, I forget what it is. Nevertheless, space groups. The three things that determine the space group are the geometry of the unit cell, the observed symmetries, and the systematic absences. 
So the geometry of the unit cell is just things like of the three cell lengths and the three cell angles. Are the cell lengths, are the three cell lengths the same? Are two of them equal in length, uh, we'll say within error? Uh, are all three different of the three angles? Are, is one or two of them 90 degrees? Are all three of them 90 degrees? Are none of them 90 degrees? And this will tell us whether we have a, a cubic crystal system, a tetragonal crystal system, a hexagonal crystal system, a trigonal crystal system. Maybe you have a, a beta angle of 120 degrees, for instance, and, and so on. Uh, the geometry of the unit cell will help restrict us to a given uh, crystal system. The observed symmetries now uh, do have a twofold across the A axis, across the B axis, across the C axis. Is there a threefold? Is there a sixfold? you would look for symmetries in the observed in integrated intensities. And this will tell us something about the space group as well. And then finally, the systematic absences are along the reciprocal lattice uh, vectors, the HOO, the A star vector, the B star vector, which is OKO, and the C star vector, which are uh, OOL. Now, there's centering operations which give rise to systematic absences. Uh, but I won't detail that here, but you need to be aware of them. But in this case, I'm talking about the systematic absences along the principal axes, uh, A star, B star, C star, or HOO, OKO, and OOL. So here is the output of uh, one program. I believe it is probably pointless. And what happens is they, you input the, the integrated intensities with a given HKL, and it basically goes through, and, it, and in the old days, a crystallographer looked at, the, at a precession photograph or something, or they did this by trial and error. This program will actually test all of the threefolds, all of the twofolds, uh, the twofolds along the uh, A, B, and C axes, and it will look at the statistics coming out here. And if the statistics are, or it's looking to see, does the right side match the left side for a twofold? Does the top side match the bottom half uh, for a twofold perpendicular to that? Or is there four folds if you look in four quadrants? And it gives a likelihood. So here, uh, for all of the combinations, and if you look at the output, for example, it will, uh, for example, compare the identity matrix, which is, say, space group P1, and compare that to the other things, and it will calculate something called a correlation coefficient, and the statistics are measured, and we'll talk about these in a little bit. But basically, it has flagged some things that have a high likelihood as the possible space group. Now, sometimes you can't decide between two enantiomorphic space groups. And in that case, the workup after scaling and so on, the scaling will be the same, by the way, it won't matter which one you pick, but the workup afterwards in the phasing, we will have to uh, do that in parallel with both enantiomorphs and pick the uh, proper space group from that. And one of the problems that you may see is that if you collect multiple crystals, you can actually have them indexed in the different enantiomorphs, and you may have to re-index one to get it to match the other. So Phoenix X Triage is another program that does this. Another program is one I wrote called DT Cell, which isn't used anymore. But here it's looking at the Lowy class, the twofold across A, across B, across C. Uh, this is a twofold across the diagonal. And looking at the R merge, it has a 5%, which is a relatively low number for the R merge when you do not do not enforce two folds, and it doesn't go up. So for all of these particular tests, it's saying that this is a tetragonal crystal, which has two mutually perpendicular two folds. And this is testing the observed symmetry. So this would restrict the space group to something like uh, P422, P4 sub 1, 212, P4 sub 3, 212, P4 sub 1, 22, P4 sub 2, 22. Two and so on. So this restricts the space group. And remember, space groups are the first bit of crystallography that you have to know. In, in the old days, you could look at uh, film. And I showed this uh, picture before. Uh, 
And I said, oh, look at these systematic absences along this axis. So this is a fourfold screw axis, a four sub one or four sub three screw. And let's call this reflection the zero, zero, 44, where L is 44. And if we go over using the neighboring rows, this might be the 0045, the 046, the 0047. This is the 0048 and so on, the 0052, the 0056, the 0060. And we clearly see that there is no intensity, at least by eye, in between these. And this judges for us that this has a four sub one or four sub three screw axis, all right? And uh, you can also see to some extent there's a twofold this way in that these two spots appear to be the same intensity as these two. This is a strong spot here and here. Uh, once you're too far away from this line, these don't match because the it's not in the plane. It's not in the plane of the uh, display here. It's slightly tilted, but when we're close, things match. So we look for the geometry of the cell. We look for the observed symmetries and the systematic absences. I'll also say this: you will not get a four sub one screw axis unless the geometry of the cell is tetragonal uh, or something pathological is happening. Okay, so this shows for a computer program looking at the systematic absences and along the OKO. So this is along B star. We see uh, strong for an even, strong for an even, very strong. But we also see for the odd reflections, it's weak, but there is some positive density here. And part of this is that it looks like a high I over sigma of almost six. Well, it's not quite as high as the 257 and the 278 next to it. But you have to take some of this with a grain of salt when you're doing the scaling because the sigmas may not be correct. They may be too low. And if we made the sigmas higher, the I over sigma will be lower. The other thing is, and maybe if I go back and look at this, you can see there is some shadowing here and here, but there could be shadowing in this direction and some of the background from a strong spot could be intruding into where you're integrating a weak spot, and it could make the weak spot have a higher intensity than is legitimate, okay? So there can be issues with integration. This shows the output from HKL or the scale pack program of HKL, and it doesn't show the strong reflections. It only shows the reflections that should be systematically absent and you might say, well, the 002 looks pretty strong. That makes this space group wrong. But once again, you have to take this with a grain of salt. There are rogue reflections in here. Uh, perhaps the uh, intensity is, the sigma is low for whatever reason, uh, something with the background and so on. Or a spot reflection, or the spot is high because of background streaking away from a neighboring reflection or there could be zingers or there could be eye spots or something like that in here so these things you have to look at many things here and the things like pointless and x triage try to do that to confirm the space group next up correct for systematic errors so you have systematic errors because of different crystal volumes different crystal exposure times different detectors you can merge data from different detectors radiation damage is something so that uh, images collected at the beginning of us exposure or have less radiation damage than those collected at the end of the exposure. There are wavelength dependent factors. The source intensity doesn't have to be stable. You hope it's stable. It will make your job easier, uh, but it doesn't have to be. You have different absorption due to different paths of the uh, incident beam wave and the scattered beam wave vectors through the crystal and other matters such as the loop or the crystal mount. Other things are happening too. Your crystal could be uh, cracked, so it looks like you have multiple crystals in the beam, or you could have picked up in the loop several crystals that uh, the beam sees, and those could give rise to Bragg diffraction that superimpose either on your, uh, your the Bragg spots you're interested in or into the background of those spots, and you of course have ice rings. And uh, a systematic error that you would like to see is anomalous scattering, of course, and you don't want to correct that away. So just quickly, an X-ray beam in purple here, 
Uh, here's a crystal in here and I've rotated it here and you can see the volume in the beam here is different than the volume of the, uh, I mean the volume in the beam here is different than the volume in the beam here. Rotate more and there's even less here. Now it's possible, I'm trying to think how this was done. I could have the rotation axis not here in the center of the crystal. It could have been right here where my arrow is and as we rotate, a big chunk of the crystal rotates out of the beam. This is very likely nowadays with modern uh, macromolecular instruments. The beam is generally, at beam lines is smaller than the crystal. So we shoot through a portion of a crystal. We may even raster a crystal to try to find a good spot with the best collection of well-ordered unit cells. So we often have a different uh, crystal volume in the beam, or we could have the beam larger than the crystal and have all of this in the beam. Uh, nevertheless, generally the beam nowadays is smaller. You could use different crystals and you could have a big crystal, little crystal, and obviously the number of unit cells in each of these examples is different and you'll have to correct for that. If you have a beam that isn't stable, maybe you have the a strong beam at one synchrotron and a weak beam at another synchrotron, or the beam decays, although with modern synchrotrons, they usually use top-up mode and they try to keep the beam stable. But different intensity of the X-ray source will be a systematic error. And I did mention absorption and I just wanted to give an example here. Suppose the X-ray incident beam is here, it's stopped somewhere down here by a, a lead or a tungsten or tantalum cup, a beam stop. And if these two X-ray diffracted beam wave vectors are for a symmetry related HKLs, maybe there's a twofold along here. Uh, this beam goes through more material of the crystal, but it could be the loop or the sample uh, holder than this direction. And so you would like to discover and correct for these kinds of absorptions in your crystals. So these things have all been applied over the years. So in the 60s, this was appreciated already by Fox and Holmes or Hamilton, Roll and Sparks in terms of trying to scale different batches of crystals together. Uh, it's not new to do multi-crystal averaging. Certainly uh, Max Perutz and the early pioneers had to do this. And I wanted to just give a quick example. Here's three reflections, the 135, 136, 137 of the black reflections in batch 0001. And the same reflections in the batch 1001, this is 001, 1001. And I've made it trivial. The intensities are 200, 400, 600, and here 100, 200, 300. So using this equation I showed before, one should be able to see that the scale factor between these two batches, I, I have to multiply the black batch by a factor of two to match this, or I could say I have to multiply the blue batch by a factor of 0.5 in order to match this. And then if we calculated all of this because they're, uh, after scaling, they're identical, this would be zero. The average would be uh, whatever it is here, 100, 200, 300, and the differences would be zero. The reality is that you have errors in the measurement and you have Poisson counting statistics and nothing's perfect. And away we go here. And I didn't show the standard deviations in these examples at all. But this is the equation. And the G is how you logically assign batches, if you will. It could be different crystals. It could be different images. It could be at first different images, scale that within the data set, and then add a new scale factor for among different crystals. Uh, and so on. Clearly, uh, it should, it, you should get this in your mind. Absorption correction applies to a given crystal and its mount. It does, you would not use the same absorption correction for another crystal. Okay? So, a added thing to this simple Fox and Holmes or K and B scaling is that mathematically it's better to use the inverse of the scale factor and furthermore, it's better, you, generally you would like to apply a resolution dependent scale factor as well. Not only a scalar K, but a so-called B factor. And this B factor is in the term 
e to the minus 2b sine squared theta over lambda squared, and this is resolution dependent. And this makes sense because radiation damage uh, creates bond breakage and other effects that cause parts of the molecule in the crystal to shift and move. And very small shifts will reduce diffraction, reduce the order at high resolution. And so what this does is uh, smoothly scales up based on resolution, things that have diminished intensity from let's say a zero dose time point for later on. And so this is quite common. So the B factor is resolution dependent and can help indicate radiation damage, which we'll discuss in a minute. And absorption correction is generally done after this using incident and scattered beam wave vectors. And two major types of equations are to use spherical harmonics or Fourier series to do this. And this is math that is above my pay grade, and so we're going to skip over it. So you determine the space group, and from that you can determine which reflections should be equivalent, so you can correct for systematic errors, but you want to validate these standard deviations. You use these, by the way, in the weighted averages. Okay, so everything, you're, everything you do here depends on everything else. All four of these things are interdependent. So what we want to know about the standard deviations is do the observed uncertainties, do the sigmas match the inspected uncertainties? So what are these observed uncertainties and what are the expected uncertainties and how do we know if they match? And I'm going to show something called the reduced chi-squared, but then why do we care if we have these sigmas right? Well, we need the proper weights for phasing and refinement, not only for scaling, but also for phasing and refinement. We don't want to make a reflection or a crystal seem twice as good as it should be by multiplying all of the sigmas by um, the square root of two or by, uh, I'm sorry, by the one over the square root of two or by one half, whatever it is. Uh, so let's take a look here. You know from general statistics and your pocket calculator what the sample standard deviation is. And I've couched, I've labeled it here as the average intensity minus the uh, observation that went into calculating the average. And you square divide by the n minus one. And that's the square of the standard deviation. This is the observed standard deviation that we calculate from measuring multiple Bragg intensities from the observations. Notice that there's no uh, sigma from the individual observation here. I've already talked uh, three or four times now about Poisson counting statistics. And this is, so unlike some other physical things, we can calculate from a single measurement based on Poisson counting statistics what that measurement's standard deviation is or what its sigma is. However, that standard deviation comes out of a detector that is in general not giving us photon counts. We're getting the counts as uh, analog to digital converter units, uh, analog to digital units, or as um, counts. And so we must correct for the conversion from photons to counts and we do that with an equation like this. This is the expected standard deviation from a single Poisson counting statistics, uh, using Poisson counting statistics from a single observation. And generally, you take the sigma and multiply it by some factor, and that's going to turn out to be the square root of the gain, the square root of the conversion factor, uh, because when you square this, this becomes squared, and it will be doing a conversion of the variance by the gain. And you add in some <clears throat> additional error uh, based on the intensity of the reflection here. And things add in quadrature to get this adjusted thing. So if we, if we get this, uh, I just say that in the various programs, uh, somebody will have calibrated the detector and the instrumental setup and so on so that they know what is the scale factor for EMOL for that particular set of hardware. And the intensity is added in is generally after you calculate everything and you get an R merge, you never get an R merge or an R measured of zero. So this residual, 
is kind of the residual error and you can multiply the intensity of each reflection by this residual error and add that into the standard deviation. So in the old days before our measure, the error model, the, this E add was often the R merge and this value was the gain of the square root of the gain of the detector. And different programs have different ways of saying this. So error scare and error model come up in say HKL. So once again, the square root of the gain. Uh, so one thing is if your detector is already, uh, the electronics in the detector already count photons, then the square root of the gain is one and the square root of the gain is one. And this might be something to consider when designing or building a detector. So how is the observed and the expected standard deviations related? Well, this is where reduced chi-squared comes in. If we take this adjusted sigma and use this equation for the reduced chi-squared, I want to recall the sample standard deviation also gave a sigma from the spread of the intensities around an average. And if you look, this equation is embodied in the reduced chi-squared equation. And so this sigma is here, and this sigma is here. And if these two are the same, the reduced chi-squared will be one. If in fact uh, the reduced chi-squared is two, then you would, well, let's say if it's four, you would like to make this number, the sigma is twice as high because if the sigmas are twice as high, two times two squared is four, and that will divide the chi squared by four, and this will get to be one. And this then will tell you something either about the gain of your detector or about the errors in your experiment that are still present in the data and the way the data appeared on the images. So all of the programs nowadays automatically make these adjustments, but you should look to see what emol and e add or the adjustments made are because if they're too high that also tells you something about your your experiment in the xds program uh, the correct package has something that says the variance of i from the intensity i is obtained from counting statistics this is this is that's this number obtained from counting statistics is replaced by a factor times the intensity plus B times the intensity squared, okay? And in the Osman paper from a couple months ago, within the last couple of months, it says the integrate step of XDS derives a first estimate for the variance here or the sigma from counting statistics and inflates it. So it multiplies, first it squares it, which gives it the variance, and it multiplies it by the square of the intensity, whoops, times 0 0.0001. So if you look here, the square root of 0 0.0001 is 0 0.01. So it adds 1% of the intensity squared to this, takes the square root and multiplies by two. Okay, this error model is then adjusted later. So all of the programs are making adjustments. So what does this mean? Well, all the way back in 1965, uh, Rollett said, a moral of this is unwise to try to cover unknown systematic errors simply by increasing the estimates of random errors. What that means is if you go back and look at that reduced chi-square, don't adjust the sigmas to one if the measurements contain systematic errors, such as incorrect scaling, uh, absorption, radiation damage, improper detector calibration, goniometer problems, shutter problems, zingers, and unaccounted for anomalous signals. If in fact you get the uh, chi-square to be one, then it means you only have only random errors left and their associated sigmas are correct. But if the chi-square is two, after calibrating for detector gain and a few other things, it says that there's something going on in your crystal. Could be anomalous scattering, could be something else that you wanna look for. Uh, the something else could be non-isomorphism. A different, a non-isomorphism means that the crystals or parts of the crystals that you shot with a beam have a different structure within the crystal unit cells. They can be different unit cell parameters. Maybe the crystal expanded because of radiation damage. Maybe it shrunk because of drying out in the beam. The molecules could be slightly rotated in the same unit cell, which would still be a non-isomorphism. 
Maybe flash cooling and freezing damaged the crystal. Maybe the outer shell of the crystal is damaged, but the inner core is okay from flash freezing. And you have a mix of things. And of course, uh, radiation damage. Basically, non-isomorphism means the same cell contents measured for all reflections. Is, well, this cell contents is not measured. Things are different. And one should not scale and merge things together that are not isomorphous. So you want to select these data sets or portions data sets are the most isomorphous and preserve your signal that you're looking for for phasing. And that leads us here to rejecting outliers. So before you reject outliers based on the hard stuff, reject outliers based on the easy stuff, shadows in the images, uh, erratic things. Uh, and then the hard stuff is if you've done scaling correctly, you can reject things that are uh, too far away from the average, like five sigma away. And new is, uh, I'll discuss the Osman paper, where they use something called delta CC one half to reject groups of reflections. Generally, if you've done a good experiment, you'll reject less than a half a percent or one percent of the observations. If you rejected too many, you have to suspect something is wrong. So here's a Pilatus detector introduced by uh, John Luca Santoni. Uh, it has multiple modules here. And you can see that between the modules, he said there's gaps. Obviously, you need to mask those out. There's a beam stop shadow. You need to mask that out. And in the corners, there's this odd shadow, which turns out to come from the cryostream nozzle. And along this right edge is a shadow that actually moves. It comes from the crystal goniometer. And as the crystal goniometer rotates, the shadow moves up. And parts of it disappear down here. So all of these things are very obvious to you when you look at the images that you must mask them out. And down in the edges here, there's some interesting things here. I don't know what they're from on this detector, extra tape or missing tape or something, but you might mask these out in the integration step. Here's a case of another erratic error, and I'll zoom in on this particular panel, which shows for a given image number, zero to 180, somewhere in the middle, this, this is the scale factors. The scale factors are varying smoothly as they should because the crystal isn't changing very much at like a half a degree rotation. And then all of a sudden it goes way high. What's going on here is the shutter forgot to open and the program is trying to scale all of these spots in this image up from zero. And because every image has partials, it's affecting the neighboring images as well. So just deleting this diffraction image from the data set uh, solves that problem. Those are things that you can look at and determine. Now, on to correlation coefficients in the last few minutes here. Um, first, I want to define it. So in Wikipedia, Pearson's correlation coefficient is commonly represented uh, as a correlation coefficient. And what the way I treat this is that it's like having two vectors of, of data. Uh, it, it could be a 3D vector, so if you were looking at, uh, or a 2D vector, Vectors that go in the same direction, if you calculate their dot product, uh, it'll be like the cosine between the, of the angle between them. So it'll be one. If they are 90 degrees apart, the, they will not be correlated and the angle, the cosine of the angle will be zero. And if they're against each other, the cosine of the angle will be minus one. So you can have negative correlation coefficients. So uh, the beauty of this is that if, as long as you get the two sets, the vectors could be 10,000, a reflection list of 10,000 on this side and a reflection list of intensities of 10,000 on this side, and you could calculate their dot product, normalize, and so on. And the mathematics is here. Uh, the beauty of these is that the, there's no scaling between these. The correlation coefficient, if you will, is self-scaling because of the way it uh, removes the average value from each of these. And, uh, and rearrangement gives this and so on. So this is now a very common way uh, since after I got my PhD to look at data and it's popularized by Phil Evans and Kai Diederichs and Andy Karplus and others. And our mergers may be useful, but this is uh, very useful. So in our case, what happens is you take a data set of all these observations, you split it into two data sets and in half and you assign measurements randomly to each half and compute the correlation coefficient between them. 
So there are some details of how to assign the measurements, uh, you know, divide in half, calculate averages here, averages here, make sure that HKLs match, reject the ones that don't have multiple measurements or not, and make sure things work. Uh, you know, so if you have an odd number of observations, what do you do? And what do you do about I plus and I minus when Friedel's law doesn't hold true and so on. But in general, you have a, a computer procedure, a subroutine, an algorithm that you can give it any two lists and calculate the correlation coefficients. And that leads me now to of these half data sets. And so what happens here is in this recent paper uh, published in, I think late May, it might have been June, but uh, the reference was earlier, the full reference, and you can look it up. Uh, what happens here is they are using uh, for multi-crystal or multi-data sets, they're calculating the uh, delta CC one half, so the correlation coefficients, correlation coefficients of half data sets. And uh, this is a blow up of uh, text directly from the paper. What they do is given a set of data, they will calculate the correlation coefficients of the data already merged together of all, let's say, 100 crystals, for instance, 100 crystals, and they'll get the divided into two half data sets and they'll get the correlation coefficient. Then they will also, for each of the 100 data sets, they will remove a, one of the da that data set. So there'll be uh, 100 different ones with 99, 99 data sets merged together, averaged to get the half set correlation. So that would be the CC one half without that ith data set. And they'll sub calculate that. Of course, they have the one from all 100 and they'll just subtract this and they'll get the delta CC one half. It turns out if by adding a bad data set, this will go negative. And if they take all of the 99 different ones that they, or the 100 different ones they get and sort them on the lowest delta CC half, they can remove uh, like the worst one, the worst one or two. So uh, basically this doing this informs you whether data set I improves the delta CC half of the whole data set or deteriorates it. So an improvement would mean that uh, removing one makes this a little bit better or keeps it in zero and adding it in deteriorates it. So you can, you can delete that and you can do this in a pipeline. So that's the beauty of this. There's no art to decide what are the bad data sets uh, that you don't want to use. And this is a flow chart of the pipeline. They scale, they integrate with XDS, scale it together, and then they go down and decide, uh, can they solve the problem with uh, shell X, say with an anomalous uh, substructure and so on. If they can, they have an answer. And this speaks back to last week when I said, how do you know you have, somebody asked, how do you know you have accurate data? Well, you're, you solve the structure, you find the substructure. If you can't find it, you go on and do this uh, in a program XDS CC half, and you reject the worst data sets, go back up, repeat scale, go back up, repeat scale until you are able to do it or you completely fail. In addition to this is that uh, if you have misindexed things like the enantiomorph set that I talked about and some other things, you want to uh, either re-index them and get it in here correctly from that separate cluster of like data and repeat this. So this is a pretty good flow chart. I, li I like it. And that's why I'm telling you uh, that you should look at this in your journal club. And although they didn't report things in the paper, about this, they did mention in the, in the discussion that you could probably do this to decide which images are good and which images are bad. So here we go, at, we now have done the scaling, we've done the rejections, uh, we've done the validation of the sigmas, we can look at these R factors. And I need to point out that in the old days we looked at R merge, how far things varied from the average, unweighted, and now we either weight by the multiplicity of the data, here with n over n minus one take the square root or one over n minus one. This is the uh, redundancy independent merging R factor and this is the precision independent merging R factor. So the R measured, whoops, indicates 
uh, the precision of the unmerged data rather than of the merged data, and the PIM gives the precision of the merged data. The papers are here to take a look at uh, for further discussion of that. So some results. Uh, this is out of HKL. I quickly want to go through a few results in the last few minutes here. There's a chart here from the HKL 3000 display or HKL 2000 where it shows the chi-squared versus the image number and in red dots and in blue dots the R factor, it's merge here, R merge in this older version of the program versus the image number. And what we see here is that the red dots are clustered between 1 and 1.5. If any image had a bad chi-squared, the red dot would be much higher here, and that would be a reason to reject the, all the reflections from that image. It means something is going wrong with that image that needs to be looked at. Either there's a few bad reflections that need to be rejected, or the entire image needs to be rejected. The R merge is, uh, there's no outliers there as well. On this side, it shows the resolution versus the reduced chi-squared in blue and yellow, and the R factor. And the difference here is uh, the blue and the red are with the Friedel mate separated. So there's no systematic errors left here when the Friedel mates are separated. The blue line is all around a chi-squared of one and level over resolution. Uh, the gold or yellow line here shows a whopping huge chi-square. So there's something systematic going on here that's showing up. And in this case, it's uh, probably a selenium or gold uh, an atom in here and so on. So the signal from selenium will be strong and from sulfur it will be weak or perhaps not even seen in some things, which we'll see in a moment. You can look at the anomalous signal detection, and this is coming out of Shell X. C plotted in HKL 3000, where the delta F for the magnitude of F plus and F minus, so this is the magnitude of the, not the intensities now, but of the structure factor magnitude. The phases aren't involved here. Plotted uh, versus uh, resolution. So it's actually the delta F over the standard deviation of this difference. And if you have an anomalous signal that you should be able to tease out, uh, you will see a signal to noise above this, I, I guess it's one, uh, one point, four, what's the square root of two or something like that. I don't actually know what the number is, but it's so on. So scaling, to do all of these four things, it's a catch 22. You can't reject outliers unless you validated the sigmas. You can't validate the sigmas unless you have correct systematic, corrected for systematic errors. You can't do anything unless you have the space group right. And, uh, and so you, it's iterative. You, as you saw in the flowchart for the XDS uh, scale CC half thing I showed a moment ago, you're doing this uh, in the computer iteratively. Yeah, when I was doing this, you would, it was an art. You pick things. You looked at results and you pick things. And you rejected things manually and got things better. And then you tested to see if you could solve the structure. So I like now that there's methods to make this automated. Question, does chi-squared or sigma affect R merge? Here's the R merge. The answer is no. There's no sigma in this equation, okay? Uh, if you change the chi-squared, it's not gonna change R merge because the way of changing the chi-squared is adjusting these sigmas. You can do anything you want with these sigmas and it won't change R merge. It uh, won't change R measured as well because there's no sigma in there. People ask what do uh, anomalous do? In these things, uh, they basically, uh, this is the output of HKL, and there's a header, the eccentric reflections and the eccentric reflections. These do not have uh, a Friedel mate. They don't exhibit anomalous scattering uh, because uh, there's, they're eccentric. There's only one here. Uh, you could consider that uh, the, centric, the eccentric reflections superimpose on each other, and you can't tease them out. And here you have uh, HKL I for I plus, I for I minus, the sigma for I plus, and the sigma for I minus. And these are used to calculate some of the anomalous stuff here. Uh, if you have a, one of the things with this program, it's written in Fortran, and if you have an error, you'll have to edit out a overflow for that. Um, we will skip this in the interest of time. Uh, HKL 2000 
one of the things it does do with the anomalous, it changes the equations that it reports here. Our measured anomalous, by definition, and, and we'll look at this, it separates the I pluses and the I minus, but it was reporting R merge anomalous. When you click on anomalous, it always reported the R merge anomalous and called it R merge. So because this is always lower than this, by definition, looking at the mathematics, it made HKL always look like it gave, gave better data. The other thing is that HKL used to report, uh, did not report the average I over sigma I for each reflection, average. It reported the average I over the average of sigma I. And if you look, here's four reflections in a data set. And if you look at their various I over sigmas, they're, they're chosen legitimately here. The average I over sigma is this equation. And the average I over the average sigma I is this equation. So by reporting this in scale pack, they made it look like their data had a higher signal to noise ratio, but it was clearly only from the sigma, the way they did these calculations. And you have to look at this carefully now. Resolution cutoff, I I'll, I'll won't say much about this. Uh, it's an annual discussion, the CCP4. There's many ways of doing that. Uh, probably the best is to do a refinement. And of course, always get good geometry. We'll skip the explanation of this. Scale or scan a sweep of data first to see if there's any problems. Send email to people. I've already looked at output statistics otherwise and talked about high multiplicity and be careful about the output I over sigma. Label it the right way. For example, in the PDB, it's not labeled the right way for many structures. So fill out the table one, reject images and reflections, detect radiation damage. So with radiation damage, you can actually um, uh, do some things, such as throw away the last half of a data set. But before we get to that, uh, scaling can be affected by hardware problems, which you can detect. Uh, there can be problems where you haven't masked out the beam center, and you have low intensity reflections here, which doesn't make sense uh, close to the beam stop. Here's the crystal decay. This is 720 images. Uh, no radiation damage at the beginning, radiation damage throughout, radiation damage worse at the end. So the R merge to the average of these reflections is, is a better to the overall data set in the middle because it's an average of the two ends. If I cut this to 360, I get the same thing because still the average around 180 is better than at the start and the end. And if I go even to 180, uh, so the previous one was 360. This is a classic case of radiation damage. Uh, another classic case here is here's two scans, and that B value goes increases monotonically up. And this is, is a nice example. I believe the entire crystal was bathed in the X-ray beam here. If the entire crystal is not bathed in the beam, other things can happen. This is the scale factor per image, and you can see this oscillation here and then going up. This is where the temperature of the diffractometer room changed. And it, the thermal expansion coefficient changed the source intensity, and then the crystal dried out. It wasn't mounted, it was mounted at room temperature. This is a difficult thaumaton. Uh, now you can see like the B value seen wacko. It's because the beam, the crystal was larger than the beam, and various things were going on. Scale factors are varying smoothly uh, within the scan, although drastically. And the reduced chi-squared is one. The various R mergers are close to 10%. You would think, wow, this is terrible. Uh, you look at the, whether there's an anomalous signal here by looking at the R mergers and chi-squareds, whether you combine or don't combine the uh, Friedel maze. And it appears there's no signal. And yet the structure, the sulfurs were found, the structure was solved and the model was going on here. I'd like to do this with the new uh, algorithms of uh, Osman, Wang, and uh, Dietrichs, and it would probably be this, this to uh, curate this data set took me quite a bit of time to get to the data that I wanted to use to do this. So there's other programs which you'll find in your career. There's other things going on, and uh, do you need to mask out the shadow of the beam stop? This is an unusual position for the beam stop. 
If you don't mask it out, the spots expected to be in the shadow are integrated with zero. And so symmetry related spots all get rejected and the R merge is seven per, about 7%. If you do mask out the shadow, the rejections are fewer. Uh, they seem to be more randomly distributed and the R merge is 3.2. So the goals for this in conclusion, we need to do scaling to average out uh, the random errors and also to uh, provide scale factors to reduce the systematic errors. I showed you how you might do it. I didn't go through the specifics of the various programs, but they all use the equations that I showed. And I showed you how you have to adjust the sigmas in order to figure out how to get rid of the bad actors or the rogue reflections and so on in a statistically sound way. And I did review some of the statistics. I want to finish here by thanking the various people that helped me write software and give me ideas or provided data over the years and, and so on. So I'll stop there. And I know I'm way over time. Maybe there, uh, we'll see what happens here with uh, questions and so on. So thank you. And I will stop sharing. I, uh, I see Andrea now. Okay. Thank you very much for um, the talk. You're not very much over time, I wouldn't say. Um, I hope you enjoyed this lecture as much as I did. Uh, I'm working um, in this field and um, yeah, I really appreciate um, seeing this thought. Um, questions? Either via chat or you can unmute yourself and show your camera so um, that we can see you and ask a question in person. <coughs> Too much mathematics for a Monday. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Um, the last times just took a while. Um, so, you have been uh, showing quite a lot of different resources to read, and I would go along um, with your recommendation to actually read the papers in case of scaling. But if someone would have no idea because he or she is a beginner in X-ray crystallography and they just wanted to start somewhere, learn like, how can I know whether the data set will be good enough to do something with it? Uh, yeah. Where should they start? Well, uh, in general, somebody is not sitting at home in their kitchen like I am. <laughs> they have colleagues that they should ask. And uh, it turns out that you might think that science and as a graduate student, you get dumped in a lab and your advisor doesn't help you. I suppose that does happen, but uh, you should uh, go and uh, look at the literature. So right now, one of the pieces of literature that you can look at is, uh, this is Bernard Rupp's book, and it does go here and uh, it does discuss some of this, right? So I would at least read this. And, and this book didn't exist when I was uh, your age, but uh, Blundell and Johnson existed and these things were available. The other thing is um, I realize that people don't want to embarrass themselves by asking questions on the CCB4 bulletin board. Uh, if, although sometimes it's okay, people do that. The very, one of the very first papers uh, comes from a CCP4 uh, study weekend, and it's Phil Evans' 2006 paper. And you should read that, uh, definitely read that, because it has a host of things in there that gets going. Because otherwise, in this field is so advanced, there, just, there really are not that many books about it. Uh, there are other books now besides Bernard Rupp's book, and the, the books are different. Some of them are more math-oriented, uh, Alex McPherson's book, he hates math, so they're more, um, let's say, non-math oriented. So that's what that I would suggest. One, read, read these books, read this paper, uh, talk to your colleagues, okay? Uh, right now, we're not really going to meetings in person, but something that as a grad student, I didn't realize is that meetings are so important to, to meet people. And I remember meeting Dale Tronroot, who might be a participant this morning, back at an Asilomar meeting 
uh, I don't know when it was, it was in the early 1980s, okay? We were, I, I, mean, I was just a grad student, I was just a doofus, and look at me now, you know? I'm still a doofus. Okay, that's, that's my recommendation. Um, uh, Peter Müller has written his book on uh, small molecule crystallography. Mm -hmm. um, in crystallography, the knowledge only goes from the master's mouth to the apprentice's ear. And it's still true that it's exceedingly difficult to learn crystallography without exposure to other crystallographers. Yeah. Unfortunately, this is an art you cannot look solely from a book, although reading the literature really helps. I, I, let me add to that, is that uh, if you have access, uh, it, we always had access to a diffractometer. That's not quite true nowadays, but there are, um, what, what I might say is that you, you might as well solve hen egg white lysozyme. It's easy to grow in your lab. It's easy to do phasing, either from the sulfurs or you can co-crystallize with uh, dicyanoorate, or you can... Uh, uh, well, it, it's not easy to soak anything in, by the way. I just say that. It's like you have to co-crystallize with various things. And it has some tricks up its sleeve. And so if, in fact, uh, your advisor as a young person in your lab, you're not in your own lab yet, or if you're an, an old or you are in a lab, it's your lab and you want to do something, go ahead and do hen egg white lysozyme. It's, it's a, it's, it is, doesn't cost much money to buy that and get going. And you could then uh, uh, install the software and so on, which is part of the struggle is installing the software. And anyway, so there you go. Um, we have two questions in the chat. The first one is from Yun Yun Gao. A technical question. How is the calibration between detector analog signal and photon counts being done? And thank you for the wonderful mark. Uh, <laughs> Matt. Okay, so uh, I've calibrated many detectors, all right, uh, as part of my job at Rigaku. And there's two principal ways that, that you can do this. Uh, perhaps the best way is the lysozyme experiment that I just talked about, okay? We know what the structure of lysozyme is. Uh, if we collect a, and we know that we can get very good crystals that have almost no systematic problems in them if you do the right thing with them. And we can then calculate uh, those air mole. We can, calc you know, we can calculate what the air model is for these crystals and use the same uh, air model on other more difficult crystals because that error, the multiplicative factor, will be the square root of the gain of the detector. Uh, it can be held consistent with a, a source that you know has a given number of x-ray photons because you can use a, a, a scintillation counter, for example, to count single photons and use that also to calibrate the detector. But in general, like a, a two-dimensional detector uh, calibration that we used to do with phosphor and stuff is we used to shine a flood field onto the uh, detector and then work our way up from that. And that was always the first step. But if you can measure photons with a single photon counter somehow on a test bed, you can then use that to calibrate your detector. But basically, most people use something like a test crystal of, um, of lysozyme or a small molecule that has no radiation damage, okay? And I, I'll read the second question here. Can we merge data collected from home source and synchrotron? And the answer is yes, sure, why not, okay? If they're the same crystal, right, the, the equations for diffraction are the same. You would have, uh, when you integrated the data, they would be integrated separately. But by the time you got to the scaling step, uh, you would have applied the polarization for the home source and the polarization for the synchrotron source to those data sets. You would have applied the uh, absorption correction. Uh, you know, you would have scaled enough to uh, take all of the experimental specific scaling factors into those data sets and then go ahead and go to the synchrotron. There will be, uh, we can say, well, the wavelength's not gonna be different, but the wavelength is only going to affect the um, F, the anomalous scattering signal, which you need to be aware of that you're not going to have the same, what I'll call F double prime and F prime for those two data sets. But if you wanted to get a, you know, if you needed the home lab data to do completeness 
or something. I would certainly, the, the experiment would be, why don't you test the hypothesis? It works better when I merge the data or it works worse. <laughs> and that's an experiment in silico that you can do yourself, okay? Um, Raj writes, thank you. Earlier, this was suggested to cut off data with I of a sigma less than two, but recently suggested that we should include as much data as possible. What's your suggestion? Right, so I, uh, my suggestion is as follows. So in the old days, they used to reject reflections that, had, that were zero and less, and that was actually bad, right? Because of uh, close to zero, there is some statistical probability that the background will be higher than the reflection. And when you average things that were all positive, when they should have had some negatives, the average will be systematically higher. And clearly those negative reflections will have I over sigma less than two, okay? Uh, now, then you get to the, that's like even if it's a, in a shell where the average reflections are strong, you have some weak ones. And, and basically you might as well keep all the data until the last possible minute. So with I over sigma less than two, that then will affect the average in the shell. And I think that uh, you should probably still keep those as long as the sigmas are correct, right? If the sigmas are not correct, then all bets are off. So I would keep the data. And then if we look at the, um, the CC one half, where you, know, you say, well, I'm gonna keep the measurements out to 1.8 angstrom, even though the R measured out there is 600% in that shell. So in that shell, the average I over sigma for the shell may be pretty bad, but it may be that there's five, six, 10 reflections in there that are strong. And by keeping those, you add some or a few of the atoms in the, in the unit cell. You help place them uh, properly in the distances between the reference planes at that resolution. And so it should not, uh, if everything is done with proper weights, it should not matter whether you leave those properly statistically weighted reflections in the, in the uh, output file or not. The reality though is, is if, if you calculate the electron density map with and without those reflections, it is not going to look different to you, okay? You could do a cutoff at high resolution below average I over sigma two, and by I in coot or someplace else, you are not going to notice uh, any difference. And so I would say to, uh, uh, you can do what you want, but be prepared to incur the wrath of a reviewer and to go back and, and do that uh, and to change your ways if the reviewer argues one way or the other. On the other hand, you should be able to justify your choice for your cutoff. So I guess I'm waving my hands and saying that you can do what you want, but it, uh, if things are properly statistically weighted and things are rejected properly, uh, it won't matter. Uh, about that cutoff. Uh, on the other hand, I, I wouldn't put in the title of my paper, you know, 1.2 angstrom resolution structure if all the data between 1.2 angstrom and 2 angstrom has an average I over sigma less than 2. It, 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 you're, you're, the information is not there and you're not, you're only fooling yourself uh, by putting that in the title of your paper. You might say high resolution structure, this is what we did. Uh, but these are my opinions, which is what you asked for, so I gave them to you, okay? <laughs>